Hi, this is Paul, and I have some very special guests with me today. And I'm not even quite sure exactly where this video is going to go. But with us today is um, some old friends and some new friends. John Van Donk is a regular here in my conversation. And John and I have a very interesting relationship. Uh, he's a schemer, and he involves me in his schemes. And I often find going along with his schemes is interesting, and it brings me to interesting places. So I, I happily get colonized to a limited degree by John Van Donk, and that is a lot of fun for me. Uh, also with me is, um, is Dale Feikema, who is the business manager of a Christian Reformed Church in Southern California, the same church that John Van Donk goes to. And you'll begin to see a pattern developing in this video. Also <laughs> with me is another friend who I've known for a number of years, um, um, Doug Vandegreen, who is a lawyer in Salem, Oregon. He's a private practice lawyer with a lot of experience doing uh, legal work around churches and church split. And so he actually is probably one of the most... Uh, Preemin I'll say preeminent lawyers, that'll make you sound important, Doug, and has the most experience dealing with uh, Christian Reformed Church order, Christian Reformed tradition. If there's been a, uh, Doug has had the privilege of dealing with a variety of messes that various Christian Reformed churches and the denomination have gotten themselves into over the last 30 years, and Doug has helped with that. Uh, both of um, these men were born and raised in the Christian Reformed Church. Dale actually grew up for part of his time in Nigeria and has a background in uh, aerospace. And Doug has been a lawyer his whole career. So I have actually not put this group together. My friend John Van Donk put this group together. And as actually John Van Donk put the conversation together with Clay Leibolt that we just had recently, and so I'm going to kick it over to you, John, and say, okay, John, why have you brought us together? And what is your scheme? What do you want us to talk about? Oh, I don't know if I would call it a scheme. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thanks to my friends here. Um, I've actually had somewhat of a relationship with, with all three of you, and I, and I very much value our, our friendship. So uh, you're all safe in this, in this context. Um, but it occurred to me that um, perhaps those of us now gathered in this conversation might have somewhat of a perspective and some input and some opinions perhaps, and perhaps even some experience with, with what appears to be on the horizon in the Christian Reformed Church. Now, we, we are not really in much of a position to be totally prophetic about that. It's not that we know exactly what is going to happen, but there are some handwritings on the wall that suggest that, um, for example, the report on human sexuality, um, though postponed by two synods not meeting, uh, will um, create some, some discussion and perhaps even some, dare I say, animosity or, 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 or lack of desire to stay together. And, um, and so we, we don't know exactly what shape that is going to take. And we don't know all the different things that are going to happen as a result of that. But uh, at least Doug here is quite knowledgeable about what happened when the United Reformed Church and the Christian Reformed Church parted ways. And so he, he has seen some, some of the perhaps gracious side of that, but perhaps also a little bit of the ugly side of that. And, um, and, and all, this, um, all this turmoil on the horizon or this uncertainty on the horizon also has implications at the local level for, for all matters financial. And um, I happen to be aware that that Dale manages a, a $4 million budget. It's like a small business. He does it all by himself. Um, but but he, he occasionally wonders what the elders are planning, what the elders are doing, what the elders are talking about in relation to where we will be vis-a-vis -vis our relationship to the denomination in Grand Rapids, to uh, denominational agencies, and, and what, what the ramifications are going to be for all of that financially. And so without really wanting to put any words in either one of these guys' mouth, um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing their respective um, perspectives on, on this 
uh, looming, I don't know if I want to call it a crisis, but, but there could be some, some uncertainty down the horizon. And I think that um, perhaps somewhere along the way, we can also insert um, the perspective that perhaps our faith is going to be tested along the way. Now, and so I would, I would leave it at that. This is my introduction to why I wanted these guys to be together. Okay. Um, do you want, John, for us to, you know, I, I am one person that thinks that that wonders what will happen after Synod 2022 in the Christian Reformed Church because of this issue, because of how this issue is sort of set up in the human sexuality report and how denominational confessionality works, uh, what, what arose a number of months ago in the Neyland Avenue Christian Reformed Church. And, you know, we've sort of had everything put on ice because of COVID for a couple of years, but the, you know, the scenarios go something like this. Um, and actually there are two scenarios that are really unfolding at the same time, which will sort of come to a head in the same synod. One is this human sexuality report, which as we talked about in the Clay Libel video, uh, takes a traditional stand on, on Christian marriage and also critically to the end of it basically makes, um, basically suggests that via the Heidelberg Catechism, this is a confessional issue. That was a different thing than the women in church office issue, where in the run-up to that conflict, there was a lot of talk from Calvin Seminary. This is not a confessional issue. It does not sort of trigger the confessional subscription mechanisms by which churches are or are not included in the Christian Reformed Church. There are really sort of two things coming to Senate 2022. One is if this report passes and it gets declared by Senate that subscription to understanding marriage as one man and one woman in a lifelong covenantal marriage is part of the subscription that we make when we sign what used to be the form of subscription and is now the covenant of office bearers in the Christian Reformed Church. There may be many in the Christian Reformed Church, or at least some, I would imagine probably a minority, not a majority, who say, I cannot sign that, that could cause a split. Another issue being the announcement by Neyland Avenue that they ordained a woman who was in a same-sex marriage um, to the office of deacon. And when something like this sort of came, began coming down the road in Toronto a number of years ago, this became... And this drew attention to the Christian Reformed Church. Synod basically said to Classis, Toronto, uh, this is something you need to deal with. And Toronto dealt with it and the church backed down. In the Christian Reformed Church, if Synod says to Classis Grand Rapids East, this is something you need to deal with. And Classis Grand Rapids East says, this is something we are not willing to deal with. Suddenly, in terms of the Christian Reformed Church, you have something of a constitutional crisis because many of the professors at Calvin College have their own sort of form of subscription that they subscribe to, which the Human Sexuality Report could impact. Um, many members, many denominational officials who work in the denomination are themselves members of Classis Grand Rapids East. If Synod basically kicks out Classis Grand Rapids East from the denomination. We have no idea where that goes. And so I'm not saying that any of this will happen in Synod 2022. Synod often prefers to sort of try to make peace and compromise and avoid collisions like this. I mean, denominations usually try to keep the happy family together or keep the grumbling family together, um, that might not, you know, that's sort of what the Reformed Church in America has been trying to do over the last 20 years with respect to this issue. And it has basically come to the point with them that large numbers of their congregation have decided they're, they're done with it. They're going to form their own denomination. Something like that happened with the United Reformed Church split that happened in the 90s that, of course, Doug was familiar with, 
Um, and so I, I assume, John, this is what you're seeing coming down the road mm -hmm. and you're thinking we should maybe talk about this from the various places we're sitting. Am I, am I correct in that? Right on the money. That is exactly what I was thinking. Uh, without any specific prediction, anticipate some scenarios that, uh, that may be relevant for each of our respective professional roles. Do you, um, well, let's, let's begin with you then, John. I'm worried about my pension. I get $135 <laughs> a month from the denomination. And I wonder if they're going to continue. Who is going to pay my beer money? <laughs> well, I even, I'm not the business guy here or the legal guy, but I can tell you for the most part in the Christian Reformed Church of all of these scenarios, the pension is probably not what you have to worry about if you're oh. already. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> I guess we're done here. Thanks guys for showing up. John keeps his beer money. Well, I don't know. So I just, I just led this off. Doug or Dale, any thoughts on maybe, maybe you want to say Vander Clay, your scenario is all wet. Your, your fears are unfounded. This is anxiety. The Christian Reformed Church will find a way to not have this collision. The thing is, I don't see Neeland Avenue backing down. We don't know what Classis Grand Rapids East will do. There are others in the denomination that, you know, putting Synod, their foot down. What, Synod was the one. So this current report that is a conservative report, Synod made the unusual step of setting up a committee that it knew would yield a conservative report, which says something about the Christian Reformed Church and something about Synod, which I don't think has changed. And so Synod does not want to see a split, but I don't see Synod doing a lot of compromise or equivocation on this issue in 2022. So... I don't know. What do you guys think? I think your analysis is pretty spot on. I would I would emphasize that I think the, the fissure here that's developing is inherently more significant than the 90s fissure over women in office. I mean, for for reasons that you say, but for other ones as well, because um, I think the women that the women in office. Well, I think that the current fissure has so much more to do with the culture around us. And I think, because one of the one of the fissures that's also developing is whether or not the CRC should be a political activist, and if so, um, in what political direction? And um, the, the the folks in the CRC bureaucracy obviously have a plan in mind as to that. That roughly didn't even exist in the '90s. So that's an exacerbating factor. And I, I would have a tendency to think that the, the two things, the, um, the same-sex marriage and the political activism are somewhat connected at least because you just see the alignments of people that think this and that on these issues and this and that and these issues. And so it makes the fissure just a wider thing. Um, so I, it, I, I think those people who are saying, and I, as a, if I read the C RCA right, they are saying, hey, how do we do this graciously? I think that's the thing that has to be emphasized. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's whether, I think it's when this division happens. And for some churches or maybe some classes, it's not going to be a big deal because they weren't all that connected to the denomination in the first place. Okay, fine. For some, it can be ripping and tearing like you don't want to see. So I would emphasize the need to do this graciously and start getting ready. Now, I've had, a, I, I've, I've, years ago, I already said we should do, um, a musical chairs thing, give everybody five years to say, uh, I'm going to align with the RCA, even though I'm a CRC, or I'm going to stay with the RCA if I'm an RCA church. And I'm going to go, our church is going to go to the CRC. And you could, I mean, you could do this another way, but I would say that the RCAs are going to be the quote, quote, progressive ones. And the CRCs are going to be the conservative ones, because it's nice to have diversity in a denomination because you can, you know, kind of have a checks and balances thing, you know, talking like a lawyer there. Um, 
but but you can only have so much of that diversity and then it breaks down like you know if we had satanists in our church it's a lot of diversity right but it isn't going to work okay lawyers always come up with extreme examples but at a certain point you can't have that much diversity because you got to think about and this is what i always think about so what do we teach our kids what's the decision about what to teach our kids so when anybody comes up with oh these are all theory okay fine what do you teach your kids I got grandkids now, and I know that my kids are thinking about what do we teach our children? Yeah. And I won't, obviously, if you're talking about same sex marriage and, and the whole of gender, gender fluidity, all of that stuff, what do you teach your kids is not an insignificant thing for parents. And that's what makes this, in many ways, a larger powder keg than the 90s women in office issue what what, what do you th what do you think dale oh what do i think uh, i i would uh, come down on the side that uh, of uh, you know when instead of just if i i from my little vantage point uh i I anticipate it coming apart, uh, and that that raises a couple of immediate issues for me. And the first one is, we are under the Christian Reformed Church nonprofit uh, group charter. Okay, uh, who ends up owning that? Uh, and then, what do the rest of us do? Uh, will we be scrambling? Uh, to try to restore uh, uh, our, our nonprofit status, maybe aligning with somebody else, or do we just right now begin to process uh, an independent uh, nonprofit application where we we stand alone and you know no matter what happens out there, we're we're in a, uh, a solid position with respect to that. Uh, Doug, I'm kind of wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, actually, I, actually, I do, and that's a very important question. Um, the, the answer you're going to like: um, CRC local congregations have um, expressly recognized 501c3 status uh, via the denomination. Okay but it's not necessary to have it in the first place. There's two kind of 501c3 organizations. One is all of those things that do 501c3 things that want the recognition. And the recognition basically says when people give you money, it's tax deductible, okay? That's, that's the essence of 501c3. So one is all those organizations that do charitable things. The other category is churches. Churches are a special category. Churches do not need to have recognized by the IRS their letter of recognition of 501c3 status. It's fine if you do, but you don't have to. And many churches, frankly, have never applied for it because it's not necessary, either legally or as a practical matter. Churches are a special animal in U.S. law, both federally and by the state. So that's one concern you don't need to have frankly. Why, why I'm a little more concerned probably uh, over us than, than, you know, your little country mom and pop church is it's just the size of our outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, about a $4 million operation a year, uh, typically process about uh, 70 uh, paychecks every two weeks. Uh, we've got the equivalent of about 45 full-time heads, uh, and uh, and we're rated as a, a medium-sized uh, business in California. Uh, that seems like that would draw a little more attention, or uh, does that have any uh, implications in it? Well, I, I think you're right to say you're a bigger organization. My church is podunk compared to yours, right? At the same time, I don't think you need to anticipate it. 
because there's nobody in the whole wide world who's going to make a fuss about it. And if somebody made a fuss, whether it's it's the IRS or the California Revenue people, you'd you'd find a lot of um, uh, good public interest law firms who would love to get their teeth into that case, <laughs> um, because you're just. It, it's, it's the, the law is just too established on that. Not to say that once this division happens, assuming it does, that you might not want to get that formal recognition because you would. Technically speaking, you can get that formal rep- recognition and it's retroactive for two years. Mm-hmm. So you could wait until the whole of two years, get the recognition. Nobody knows that you've disaffiliated from the CRC assuming that was the case. I don't want to assume anything. So I just, I just wouldn't look at that as my concern. May I ask a question of clarification, Doug, mm-hmm. because you say that it does not matter for the institution itself, but um, would, would individual donors be reluctant to donate to an agency which, which does can't not produce the letter? cannot produce the letter? Is that an issue at all? As a practical matter, in my experience, I have found out, I, I have determined that's never an issue for givers. I, I have not yet seen an organization where that's an issue. I mean, most people will never ask you for your, if now, if you're a recipient of grants from large organizations, they will ask for it. They're the only people that do. And most other people will say, what, what's that? I fairly uh, frequently get asked for uh, a, what is it, W-9? Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, would we still be able to uh, yep. check the, uh, the 501c3 box with a, uh, with a clear conscience if, yes. if, if we've had that suspended? Yes, because you are, you are by definition if you were a church. This is kind of weird to people that churches get this automatically, but they do because of federal law, which frankly preempts state law. Churches are a special animal within our legal system. So they pop up all the time and I'm sure half of them, if not a whole lot more, haven't ever gotten it. And not, not that if you're a big church that it isn't a good practice to get it, but I just think it's, 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 it's just not a significant issue. You know, if you're going to be like, once I had a client that I no longer had to, as a client right away, uh, that is fairly soon, because what he wanted to do is have a fake church, kind of, sort of, because he could make money off of that. So I think, uh, maybe you should get another lawyer. Well, okay, well, <laughs> from his perspective, it would be important to apply and get that 501c3 status, right? Because his church was kind of fake. Okay, but I've been to your church, Dale. You're not a fake church. You're not a fake church. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, there's a couple you got of been people, but other than a that, couple you're of not people I know there, one of which is John, another of which is my son and daughter-in-law. You're not fake. <laughs> and that's the only time I'd worry about it. But, you know, maybe if you were some novel kind of church, like, you know, Church of the Holy Crystals, I don't know. Uh, okay, <laughs> maybe, yeah. or I just wouldn't worry about it. It's, and, and you would have time to do it. That's just the answer I'd give you if I was your lawyer, which I'm not. Well, let, let's talk about based on, now, Doug, you were very active with the, with the URC, you know, how, see, I don't, usually these things sort of unfold organically we sort of watch it unfold in the rca i mean in the in the reformed church of america basically it's usually a bunch of high profile pastors get together and they basically say we're sort of done with this and we're going to start a thing and others hear about it that are sort of like-minded and say we want in on your thing too now in the christian reformed church again i you know, my general rule of thumb is churches split right and leak left. Um, because that's usually the way things go. In in this case, I mean, the Christian Forum Church right now, we have another of other fissures, such as the binationality, 
where we just had an executive director resign rather suddenly with very little information given to the denomination over um, issues and differences with respect to American and Canadian um, tax and legal things. And so there's been that stuff sort of kicked up. But, you know, I would, if, if for example, Synod decides to do nothing in 2022 to Neeland or basic, basically adopt the human sexuality report as sort of a recommendation, sort of not deal with the confessionality issue, um, that might be something Synod does that would antagonize some more conservative churches. Probably a lot of, a lot of other churches would just sort of say, okay, we dodged a bullet this year. There's nothing we have to do. But, you know, the way that it happened with the U United Reformed Church, I think was somewhat telling in terms of how these things come apart. What, what do you have any well, light you can shed on that, Doug? Yeah, yes or no, because I happen to know that history right intimate, very intimately, because our church was the first church that the then not yet existing URC, the, the URC happened quite a bit after the, so let me back up. I thought and still do that it was relatively clear that one of the exacerbating elements about the 90s division was that there was a seminary in search of a denomination. Hmm. You know, we have a seminary, right? It has a denomination. Well, back then, Mid-America Seminary, they were back in Orange City at the time, Orange City, Iowa, they did not have a denomination. And the, the, the quote, big people over there were in fact the sons of big name CRC pastors who did not get a position as professor at Kelvin Seminary. That, to my knowledge, that element does not exist here yeah. in right now. Right. And that's probably the only good news. In other words, we, when, when, when some folks tried to remove my local church from the denomination, and we were early, early, early on in that scenario, that battle was being fought by Mid-America Seminary. And I know that for a fact, firsthand, having observed it. But what you said to Dale basically is, you know, churches, you know, one day a church says, we're part of the Christian Reformed Church. The next day the church says, we're part of the pure Christian Reformed Church. Um, right. Basically in terms of tax and business stuff, the government doesn't care. The government does not care. Now, where where you mechanically, just logistically, get involved in this is, um, so so in in the CRC and in other churches, everybody thinks that we're bound together by our creeds and confessions, right? Well, not really. We're bound together by a church order, and even then, at the local level, you know what you're really bound by? Your Articles of Incorporation. It's your articles of incorporation that incorporate or not, or subject to the exceptions in the church order. And um, I don't know if you've ever polled CRC churches for what their articles of incorporation say, because most of them don't know, right? Well, I've incorporated CRCs, right? And there are decisions to make. Um, the CRC denomination has these model articles, but it doesn't even say you have to, you have to use these. So when, when, when I help a CRC create articles of incorporation, which is a preliminary authority, quite frankly, to church order, it's just that there has to be enough connection to the two so that you are CRC. But you know what? Nobody from the CRC ever checks it. So it's, it can say all kinds of things. So if you're talking about, and, and this is where church splits get nasty, because some people think they can just do anything, and I can tell you horror stories about this, but you got to look, first of all, what do your articles and corporations say? And, and, and if the church is going to change, then the articles of incorporation are really your first um, point of authority on what you, a local church, are. 
those article corporations will say that we're a CRC church and, and we agree to the church order subject to these exceptions or not. Yeah. John. Are you there, Vendonk? Yeah, is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if Doug could uh, maybe give an example of how one of those um, articles, if a corporation changes, have uh, taken a local congregation in a, a direction that the majority of the, of the members might not have wanted to go. Because sometimes these discussions about articles of incorporation happen at a level that most of the members of the congregation are completely unaware of. Depends on whether somebody has a lawyer. Um, se seriously. Um, so I won't name the church, right? Uh, there's even Please don't. yeah okay there and there's there's two of these that are roughly the same what the existing council did which was inclined to take their con their congregation out of the crc what they did was literally they committed crimes um in one case they formed a new corporation and quietly deeded the real estate and the title to the bank accounts to the new corporation and your eyes are rolling just correctly paul <laughs> theft <laughs> i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe it then in another church and this is after we thought we had an agreement i went down there in person with another classes person about this i thought we had an agreement sure enough i find out that after we came to an agreement persons told the state i won't even say which state that the articles of incorporation had changed. Uh, there's a protocol for changing your articles. Of, and that was a misdemeanor wow. to, to do that. But it happens. It happened in two cases where you'd say that would never happen in those churches. They were not podunk churches at all. And you're going, what? Are you kidding? So yeah, when this stuff happens, you could be surprised at what people do. Well, I don't know about that. I, Go ahead, John. I have a, I have a follow up question to that, Doug. Uh, uh -huh. Are you, I, I mean, what, what might be the underlying reasons why the leadership or portion of the leadership of any given congregation might feel compelled to start making changes? in the bylaws. My, 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 my question actually is, would it not be a better idea that the general reason for making the changes in the bylaws first be announced to the congregation and there be a vote of direction, that, that, that the yeah. body, the leadership is directed by the body, by the members to change the bylaws for such and such and such a reason, which may be a good reason or a bad reason, but at least it arises from- Absolutely. I mean, my, my own advice will always, well, number one, it may well be unlawful not to, to do what you said. Even if it would be lawful, and I could explain in what circumstances it would be, is it wise? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, I mean, e even though councils as defined by CRC church order have quite a bit of power to do things outside the congregation, um, that power is not absolute. And if you look at the church over, you know, you shouldn't lord it over people. And then you have to ask the congregation for advice. But even if you have articles of incorporation that, that, that deviate some from that, rarely will you find the case that you can have these council members do all of this in secret. Uh, that, that, that's going to be really rare. It's, no, but sometimes they're asked to. The congregation is asked to endorse it after yes. the fact, but they don't even know what they're what they're endorsing or oh, what the or, what your original reason was to do it. That that just means you have irresponsible council members. That simple, but but like I said, I didn't know that people in the CRC would would do this. <laughs> I don't know of any case either. Well, well, yeah, right. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, and I'm trying do. to, and I'm trying to figure out what this video is for, because we, we <laughs> didn't come here to, to create a video in terms of how to leave the denomination, because I don't think any of us want in, that. In the nineties, there, there was a manual on that circulating among those that were leading. I have it a copy. They didn't know that. 
<laughs> Dale. But but this sort of stuff happens if there is not a gracious dealing with each other. If if church people don't act like church people ought to act. And and in every case, if you had to say, if if you asked me, what 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 was the motive? What were they trying to accomplish? I hate to tell you, but I think the motive was real clear. They wanted the money and the real estate. Wow. That's ugly. W- yeah. Without exception. They wanted the money and the real estate. Now, in, yeah, that's pretty ugly. Do you, do you think that this, um, you know, in the 1990s, there were a lot of, or there were some really, uh, some of the splits went down to the church. I mean, when, it's, but, you know, a lot of these splits to the right, to the URC, some elements of the church wanted to leave the denomination because of women in church office. Others wanted to stay. They didn't want to leave there. I know in Southern California, you had some, you know, realignments down there. Um, that was not uncommon. Do you think, is, even though I, I agree with you, Doug, that in some ways, this issue goes deeper than the other issues. And there are certain environmental aspects to this particular time that I don't think we had in the nineties as much. Um, I don't know if we'd see as many churches coming apart, you know, the local churches splitting. I, I wonder if we would more see whole, see, I don't, I actually don't think that the Christian reformed church is going to, change its mind on this in terms of the conservative thing i think if there's any split we'll see it will likely be pastors and congregations who can no longer tolerate the traditional position and therefore decide to leave or that and this i think would be even more difficult let's say synod says to classes grand rapids east your unwillingness to deal with Neeland Avenue is intolerable. Does synod discipline a classis? Well, as a practical matter, then you have to say, what does discipline mean, right? What does discipline mean? As a practical matter, and again, I'm going to talk like a lawyer here, but, but now is where we come to the relationship between law church order, da, 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 da. And, and this got involved in a, in a couple of cases mine of mine, including my own church. You know what classes can do? Remove council members. Yeah, I know that. And yeah, and that well, was, and, and you that, know, so if, if clan, if classes Grand Rapids East wanted to remove the council members of, of Neeland Avenue, yeah. classes has that ability. Yeah. But what about synod? I believe they do. Now, is that crystal clear in the church order? Hmm. There's a lot of things that are not crystal clear in the church order, especially when it comes to stuff like this, right? Um, but I believe they do. When we had my own church thing, we were doing research into Dutch documents, you know, CRC decisions of synod in Dutch. Fortunately, we had somebody in classes who could read Dutch, right, for precedent. Because this is not unlike in some ways, the US legal system. You look for, okay, can we do this, you know? Um, and then, but, but I had two cases where, um, yeah, uh, what happened was classes removed the council members and then, um, and that basically removed that sentiment of the ruling body of the, lo- of the local church that was inclined to do that. I think synod can do the same thing because synod can do, it kind of just steps up. Would synod be politically as inclined to do it? No, they wouldn't just because that's a very cumbersome apparatus. And now it would be what council of delegates that would do that because they're basically synod's interim committee. I had an interim committee do it with classes back in the nineties. So they could, but I think that that kind of fight, that kind of disagreement would be too explosive that they would stay away from that. 
if they stay away from it, though, I mean, because part of what you have right. in the CRC is if <clears throat> Sinan says, boy, addressing this sure looks like a lot of work <laughs> is going to be a lot of conflict. You know, we just don't want to do this. There's then you have the scenario where you have elements of the denomination that say, we will not tolerate being in a denomination that looks the other way on this. Because if you look the other way on Neyland, you're going to look the other way in Toronto. You're going to look the other way in other places. Right. That's sort of a way of changing the denomination without changing the church order. I would say that if, if, if Grand Rapids East, the classes were told to deal with it and Grand Rapids East said no, and then this had to come to synod, so they basically you have a renegade classes, right? Yeah. Um. What was what was the first battle in the Civil War? <laughs> well, I, and and of I, course, I well, I think that would um, accelerate things a lot. Would they not I seat would, the, the de, would they not seat the delegates of that closet? Is that one of the, the, the mechanics that could happen? Well, you get all kinds of weirdness then because it's that classes. You know, probably, yeah. you know, your executive director, your I mean, so many of the people. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh. All of their all of their <laughs> positions are tied to their credentials, which are tied to their church, which are. I mean, that's why this is such a strange beast. Now, you guys in Southern California, I know. I mean, when you guys started at your church, it was Calvary. Now it's Cross Point because you guys went through that split. And in some ways, your local congregation is the result of a fruit basket upset in Southern California. And there are these other URC churches in the neighborhood and you guys, I mean, how does that look for you guys in your church? I mean, do you think about that or is that all just ancient history now? <laughs> Go ahead, Dale. You were the president of the council. <laughs> oh. Watch uh, what you say. <laughs> I, I think it's 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 sort of out of mind. Um, I just it, it was a long time ago. Uh, we've we've had uh, some some good growth since then. Uh, we uh, yeah we've lost a few. There's been some turnover. Uh, I I think that's just a distant memory there, and. You know, I hope the old adage doesn't come true that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that uh, we're, we'll kind of wait and see. But in, in that regard, uh, as, as I look at the leadership of our church in terms of, of the, the council or consistory or whatever your, your, your term for it is, um, I, I wonder at times how current they are on what the situation is and do they appreciate what's, what's really happening. Now, now, you know, the crowd I'm looking at here on this video, you know, you guys live this stuff pretty close. You're up to, to speed. But when I look at our council, I wonder okay, these guys are, are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, how, how do we keep a leadership up to date in this if they're just sort of happily going along uh, I, I'm not phrasing this very well, but I, I hope you're, you're following me a bit. Uh, one, one of the uh, specific issues that I see as, as the business guy is our church had abandoned the quota uh, system of years back uh, and just switched over to a tithe based. Okay. And, and when you're talking about, you're talking about the local money that you send to the denomination for both denominational 
um, functions and also joint ministry out. That's what the uh, quota system is, just right. for people listening so they'd understand the CRC nomenclature. Yeah, uh, correct. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, and now the, the, the assessment method has changed, right? There's the pledge and our church made a pledge uh, a, a generous one, but yet one that we felt we could still honor in these strange times with uh, the COVID and, and churches being closed down. So, you know, you, you have to kind of look at it from a monetary standpoint. Can we, can, you know, what can we afford? Uh, but then uh, no sooner did they approve that. And then they turned around and say, what well, we're going to keep tithing. Uh, and that makes me wonder, okay, I, on my business card, it says steward of the house. Okay, business manager is, is my official title, but I view myself as the doulos, the steward of the house. Okay, and I, and I, I take that seriously. Okay, and, and with what I hear in regard to the congregation or the, the um, denomination, and I see the amounts of money we're shipping, and I'm thinking, are we being good stewards? Hmm. I, 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 when, how, how do you assess that aspect of it? And, and how do we educate? Or uh, I, I, I'm almost kind of lost here to explain it, but I, I think you're kind of getting the, the gist of, of my question. Well, well you... go ahead, Doug. Okay, so you're not that different than my church. Um, I know about these things, right? And probably Pastor Rob does too. I probably know more about them than he does. Um, if you took everybody else, they'd be more like your church, Dale. They don't know about these things. It's my theory that the further you get from Grand Rapids or Toronto, and our churches are both a long ways away. We're on the West Coast, right? All of us are. Right. Even though you've got exceptions like the guys here, the less they're aware of what their denomination is even doing. I mean, you know, I don't even know how many people read the banner anymore. Um, you know, went through. I mean, they, they, they don't know. So when you say the word stewardship, uh, right now, my congregation is by my motion, considering whether to give much less to ministry shares as part of that pledge, just because of what we see the bureaucracy is doing with all of this. And, and the CRC has changed that way too. We no longer have a big publishing house, which we all thought was good. We no longer as a denomination directly financed missionaries but rather they get their support directly and then we look at what they added and we go is this what we want to do communally and that's my pitch about stewardship because i have a lot of disagreements with what the denominational bureaucracy whether it's with synod's blessing or not and i think it's some of each um you know they have kind of a different cultural posture over there in grand rapids it seems um, they like to make uh, political activism uh, and in a certain direction, part of the institutional church. That was never me. And I'll tell you right now, that's never really most of anybody in my church. So when you actually do see these things, but very few do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, is, is it stewardship to fund those things that you, if you, what what are they doing with that i'm i'm with you on that one I, my church is small i happen to be the guy that made the motion but you can imagine that right paul right John? yeah well <laughs> and 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 dale what you said just really struck me these guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists when you said that because my church is there's a few hardly any just Gosh, how many really left here? Two, three, four people who maybe have connections to the broader denomination. The rest of the people, 
you know, I could I could stand up in church and say, oh, let's join this denomination over here. Let's be non-denominational. <laughs> and probably a good number of my people would say, well, pastor, oh. if you think that's best, okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, all right, makes me a little nervous. And we, you know, going to classes, I think, to a degree, there's more of an understanding that, okay, well, because you go to classes meetings, and I often try to get my people to send it just to sort of have them see what we're connected with more often, but we all are on the West Coast, and I, boy, I, I see, I, I don't, and we live in a time when I know Doug watches some of my videos, and Don hardly any because I'm annoying to him, but um, oh, he only watch John only watches the videos he's in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we live in a time when there are other individuals, publishing houses, YouTube channels, mega churches that are more influential in the lives of our denomination and the people in our churches than classes and synods classes and synods or and faith and the alive the banner um yeah. you know i i sometimes go to denominational youtube um youtube productions and see just how many people watch their videos and more people watch mine um, and I'm not saying that to brag, and I'm not saying that to try and pull any power trips or anything like that, but it just, uh, I mean, Dale, when you said um, these guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists, I mean, you, I mean, before we started, you told your story. I mean, your parents went to Nigeria and put you in a boarding school so they could serve the Lord and the denomination you know, you went to Cal back in those days, you went to Calvin College and Calvin College gave free tuition to missionaries kids. That denomination is long gone. <laughs> it is long gone. And and so, you know, this this happens in both ways. You know, when Doug talks about, and we actually did a video with Doug a while ago because there was a a um Doug and his pastor had a had an overture before synod with respect to political activity in the church, and we had a conversation with that. With, but it get, it gets to me this question that, well, let, I mean, your church in Southern California, you guys are large enough that if if I don't know if it would work in your church though, because you've got some real deep roots, but you know, if you said we're going to be a non denominational congregation. In some ways, partially because of the legal stuff, Doug, you pointed out, that's easy for a church to do. I know a church right now that is, they're on the conservative end of things. They are sort of asking questions like that, and they have to deal with their local membership. But I, I think, you know, for me, for, for me, the most interesting aspect of this current church fight, which is why you know, John and I just did a conversation with Clay and I got a little bit of, you know, I got a little bit of heat from some people about, you know, why are you putting a guy like that on your YouTube channel? Okay. And that some of that heat comes from denomination people. Some of that heat comes from my audience that has no relation to the CRC because, you know, every, everything, like you said, Doug, everything sort of polarizes around this issue. And you know, there are huge issues involving, you know, I, I think one of the things that we haven't even talked about, the real questions have to do with denominational properties like Calvin University, like mission agencies that actually own thousands or millions of dollars worth of real estate, have, you know, large multi-million dollar budgets have, you know, those kinds of things. That's a whole nother thing because I don't know. I, I, to me, a lot of people will look at this and say, this is a fight about gays. And 
to me, the much more interesting questions are about what is the church? Yep. And, and Dale, I mean, when you said it, it was like a light went off. These guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists. And when you said that, I thought that is so true. And that's not just in your church. I wonder what percentage of the Christian Reformed Church in North America is either on one hand sort of blithely disconnected and there's just sort of a name and goodwill and that's out there, or they still imagine they're connected to a world that is just gone. Yeah, yeah and Paul, scary, but. You, you have said often, Paul, that there's a need for a con you know, a confessional conversation, which yeah. I quite thoroughly agree with. I, I would add to that, there's a big need for a conversation about what is the institutional church. And I, when I put in the word institutional, you know that I mean something about that. I'm not talking about the church universal, but what is that institution, that, that formal organization that we call a church, and then it can have various you know, upward manifestations, you know, classes, synod, or whatever you want to call it. But what is it I would actually say that our existing church order actually defines what that is and not so unclearly, we've just discarded our respect for it. Hmm. And so we, we no longer confine ourselves to what our own church order says reasonably clearly that our ch institutional church is supposed to be. And when, when I did, um, uh, in 2012, I wrote in the classes adopted uh, a, a prior overture before the one that we sent in more recently. I mean, that was the question, what is the institutional church? Um, and I think those who do not want to be constrained in what they have their denomination do, they don't want to have that conversation. Probably just like people don't want to have the confessional conversation. I think both of those there's a lot of resistance to have the conversation. Instead, it's sort of like, well, we just want to get our way, <laughs> not have the conversation. <laughs> but I remember that was the case when I was in uh, Synod 92. I was on the, should we ratify women in our office committee, right? And I found that to be the same thing. Everybody in the committee, I think there was 13 of us. And um, everybody, and I actually wanted to discuss it. Of course, I'm not a, a you know, I'm not a, dominantly a churchman i'm not a pastor not, nobody wanted to talk about it they just they wanted, wanted to, to win. they just wanted yeah and um nothing's changed in many ways we don't want to talk about the underlying issues but i think they are twofold one is confessional you know creeds and confessions right and, and how you read scripture and things related to that. but the other is almost more related to lawyer stuff in that what is this institution and what is it not? So what is it when we go to church, whether our local church or upward manifestations, what is it that we agree that we don't have to agree about? I want to be able to go to church with those who are politically divergent from me and in divergent in many other ways. But what I don't want is for us to bring all of those things into our church and say, our church has got to be sort of a superstore of dealing with all of these. No, because you, you'll blow every last one of them up and we'll all be a church unto ourselves, won't we? All right, John. Well, well Dale, I, you said you looked like you wanted to talk before. I don't yeah, know if you Dale first, Dale first, Dale first. Go ahead, Dale. No, I didn't have any. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just want to echo, you know, what the stuff that people don't want to talk about. I mean, we're having a little bit of a conversation about how to read scripture on voices. And, um, you know, it is, it is, it is a little uh, bit CRC of CRC voices is a listserv. John's not having these conversations because he hears in his, voices head. In his head. <laughs> I want to make that clear. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> But as a result of the conversation with Clay, Clay enunciated a particular way of reading the Bible, and he stood by it, and he articulated it clearly. You would think that people who disagree with his way of reading the Bible would step forward, like, on a moment's notice, 
and articulate their particular way of reading the Bible in such a way that other people can evaluate that, can, can look at that, can compare it with what Clay said. And there might be multiple different ways. Actually, I know there are multiple different ways of reading the Bible. So you would think that that discussion, as fundamental as it is, would, would emerge rather quickly. But it's not. It is like pulling teeth to get people to talk about what are the very foundations of our institutions and our doctrines and our belief system. And I find that odd. I, I, I wish somebody would explain that to me. Maybe I'm the wrong partner to have the conversation well, with. I you don't know, know that saying, and I think I put it on CRC Voices, there is no truth, only power. <laughs> that too much describes all of us. Well, I... Call me a child of the Enlightenment, if you will. <laughs> well, I, I think, well, people are people love their local church. And so, you know, Dale, he's the, he's the steward of the house. Um, people give to your church and to my church and to Doug's church because exactly. the church is for a lot of different reasons. Partly the church is doing something for them. The church is maintaining something for them. The church is affording something, not just for them, but for the world in general. They believe in the mission. The mission is, it, it is sometimes articulated, but it is mostly just sort of seen and understood. And they really only react when something happens in it that they sort of instinctively and intuitively back away from. And again, all of us in this group having doing this talking are uh, unusual in that we've spent a fair amount of time thinking about these things, also working on the inside of these organizations and understanding you know, how the sausage is made in some cases. But, and, and the same goes for this issue about you know, same-sex marriage. You sit someone down and you say, for or against? And they'll give you an answer, but that answer doesn't necessarily tell you a whole lot about anything. And that so much of what's happening is sort of beneath the surface. And so as long as nothing too egregious is happening, well, let's just kind of keep going because life is busy and we've got family and jobs and things going on. And especially out here in the West, Eh, stuff happens in Grand Rapids. Um, it'll all be fine. There have been fights before. Um, we the soup is never those. eaten as hot as it is served. What's that? The soup is never eaten as hot as it is served. Dutch That's saying. a Dutch thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't speak a word of Dutch. <laughs> well, and and so I, you know, and I, I think about the crazy audience of the talk about a diverse group who listens to this channel and, and how people will hear this. You know, I like, I like John, how you sort of pulled it back and, and Doug too, you know, I, I'd maybe change it a little bit. What is the institutional church? What is the institutional church for? Um, because, you know, let's say the denomination you know, my, my guess of what will happen in 2022 is that Synod will make some noises. In some ways, the human sexual sexuality report in terms of its specific application, which would be a legal confessional application, that will likely, it'll attempt to be blunted. And I think that's exactly what everyone will look at with that. If, if it's blunted by Synod, conservatives are going to be upset. If it isn't blunted by Synod, progressives are going to be upset. And if progressives, you know, part of the dynamic is that, like we saw with the women in church office fight, when progressives got upset, their main focus tends to be because of their positionality, we need to drag the rest of the church forward with us in time. That's their orientation, okay? And so they're usually, that's why churches tend to leak left because people just, I'm sick of this business. I'm going to go to a church that sees things the way I do. That tends to be the leaking. 
because it's the progressives mission to we're the vanguard we're on the cutting edge i am who you're going to be 10 years from now so let me help you come into the future that tends to be their position but in this case as you also said doug we live in a context in which to be publicly aligned with a church that isn't affirming and your sons and daughters, your friends, everyone around you looks at you and says, how could you be associated with such a bigoted church? Um, that now has a social cost. And I think for that reason, for progressive churches, that even if even if Synod doesn't come in with a sharp knife and say confessionality to the Heidelberg Catechism implies embracing traditional marriage. And if you're outside that line, you are subject, you are outside of our confessional sphere. Even if Synod doesn't do that, I think many progressives just by the fact that Synod is not going to pass anything that looks like affirmation will make progressives feel uncomfortable and also puts properties like Calvin University continued in the hot seat because whereas, as you said before, churches have a whole lot of shelter in the U.S. legal system. We've seen that in COVID. You know, what, what you know, some churches in Southern California you know, taking things to the Supreme Court and won. I mean, that says a lot. But Christian colleges, Christian schools, those are going to be the institutions that I yes. think are really in the crosshairs. And that is going to impact the church dynamics. It, it is. Uh, and you're, 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 you're especially right there. The, the, the insulation that churches have because of that special animal church status in this country Christian colleges, Christian day schools do not have. And that all gets intertied with the cultural issues that are increasingly embedding themselves into our church culture. And that's what makes this so tough. I've always looked at when I think of, okay, so what, what is a local church, right? I always think uh, it's my family. You're it, a Protestant. It, it, <laughs> it, right. It's the family within my family you know, we're all family. And if you, if you would poll the people in my church, I mean, we're pretty small. And if you said to them, you, you wouldn't even have to prep them. You say, what is the one best thing about this church? We'd say we're a family. Yeah. It's not that we don't disagree. Once upon a time, that family extension, and it still does go up to our classes, but does that family extension go on to the denomination? You know how sometimes you have a strange families where you get certain siblings and then there's another sibling and their differences just get so big okay maybe they're blood and and bones family but they're estranged and and once upon a time that was not the case in the crc denomination and i think it's gotten to be the case where on some of these fundamental issues like you think we ought to care for our parents but you think not or you think that there should mom be moms and dads uh, for children. And you, oh, there's some fundamental things at stake here, which is to a certain extent, given what culture has given us, this is a really tough issue. I mean, just inherently, we're not making it a tough issue. It's a tough issue. You know, every now and then your culture runs into these issues that really, obviously slavery was one of them, right? Um, this is this is a really tough issue. This it just is. And it's going it, to and it it is even if we don't make it, it it's going to break up people. Yeah, it already is. Yeah, yep. I mean it, it is. I mean we've been looking at this go through different denominations, yeah. and you know I also hosted a conversation with some pastors from the RCA in British Columbia on this channel. And these were three RCA pastors speaking to a CRC pastor. And they're like, well, will the C and this is a whole classist that was looking at joining the CRC. Is this a safe harbor? But then they watch a conversation <laughs> like this and say, we've been living this in the Reformed Church of America for 25 years. We're going to go over to ship. you. Um, and then, of course, Andrew wants to say, well, let's have the grand swap, which is what you said, Doug. Well, yep. all the progressives can go to the RCA, but 
the thing is in the RCA, the RCA had been growing um, along the lines of, of much more big box evangelical churches. And the group that is actually splitting out of those, for example, says something like, well, infant baptism, infant baptism isn't something that we can agree on, which is a bridge too far for most CRCs. But how many CRCs? We don't know, which brings me back what's probably going to be the title of this, this conversation, Dale. These guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists. And that, that I'm afraid, is, is a real story. And I don't know that the church has the appetite or the interest to actually look at that because what happened in Toronto was sort of there was still enough stuff in the denomination that there was a level of trust that we would say just like you said Doug with respect to family oh you know we got a dis different disagreement on this but at some real deep level we're all they're one of us and you just go back to Toronto and we trust take them to the woodshed and we, we trust you. Not even that. You know, we we understand this is difficult. We trust you. I don't know that we have that anymore. Well, that's one of the things that you talk about when you talk about what is a church. Where does the church jurisdiction and and the same sex marriage thing makes us really difficult because you again it's one of those man you couldn't find a better issue to test that right. But there are other things. What is it that the family has to agree about? And what is it that the family says, your family, smack dab in the family, but you and I don't have to agree. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a plumber. You're going to be a bar owner. Okay, fine. Or is that not fine? Right. Well, and women in office. So the denomination said it's a, it's okay to not agree on this, but now 20 years later, did okay we stopped fighting about that at synod but many women who are pastors say i feel like second class citizens <laughs> pastors who are you know complementarian who don't believe women should be serving in church offices say we feel like second class citizens and i mean that hasn't gone away but that itself won't break us no and it didn't well it it split off a bunch C correct back when but yeah. I still think that has to, more to do with the seminary in search of a denomination. Hmm. But, uh, but that's my view just from being engaged in this back in the time when it happened. Everybody said it was women in church office and I would always say, no, 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 no. That may be the rallying cry, um, but fundamentally it wasn't that. It was this, this seminary needed a denomination. They got one. Oh, that's interesting. Well, the, I mean, I mean, in Southern California, you guys also, I mean, the, that cluster. So there was a cluster of CRC churches before that split. And so, you know, you had Westminster West. I mean, you guys had some realignment down there too. But a part of this is also, um, you know, it, part of this is also local stuff. So also for you guys in Southern California, I, you know, in terms of what your church decided to do with COVID, and this isn't at all unusual with others, you've got, if your church, you know, took a harder line with respect to COVID shutdowns, uh, there are other churches that stayed open. And then you, because I know a church, a large church in my classes took a little stronger line with COVID shutdowns, a large church, and, you know, how many members have they lost? And, but again, to me, that goes back to what you said, Dale, these guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists. And what happens to a lot of people is they wake up one day and they say, the denomination that I'm loyal to no longer exists. I'm lighting out for the territory and I'm going to find something new. But even if you say the denomination no longer exists, I don't think it follows at all that my local church no longer exists. Because nobody assumes an identity anymore between the local church and the denomination. I mean, once upon a time they did. Right. That, that that's yeah. that's pretty thin thin that's, soup at this point. I mean, so so say if 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 you took my my 
church. And we decided to affiliate with the PCAs. Okay, let's just, and let's say we did it, you know, per John all and per me, all above board, da 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 da. Would anybody leave because of that? No. I don't think what anybody it, would care. What, yeah. What about your church in Southern California? Dale? I mean, oh. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'd echo the, uh, the remark that uh, Doug just did. Uh, it, people will, will will stop in and 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 see me. You know, I mean, it, it's it's a it's somewhat of a high visibility position I have, and and I get people regularly uh, stopping me, thanking me, uh, 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 asking questions about uh, you know how's the church look, uh, or do we have enough money? Do you need a little more? Uh, I, I've, I've never gotten a, a question about, hey, hey Dale, uh, what's happening with the denomination? Hmm. Uh, it just, I mean, 2,500 miles out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and, and what little you hear, it's like, oh, do I really want to hear this? You know, I, I, we'll, just, we'll just be our own thing out here. I suspect the responses in Western Michigan would be different. I don't know that. I don't live there. I just think they would be. I think there, there's more connection between your local church and your denomination. Well, the denomination is a much bigger deal there. Right. People work for it. The percentage of churches in Grand Rapids that are Christian Reformed is quite different than it is yeah. in Sacramento, Salem, <laughs> or Orange County. But then you also have this phenomenon, because I grew up in Northwest Iowa, and I still have a lot of family there, right? And, and I, I've been on the Dort Board of Trustees, da, da, da. so, you know, I got a pretty good temperature of Northwest Iowa. I think people would be surprised at how much Northwest Iowa does not give a rip about the denomination. Of course, some of them may say, oh, I heard Doug Vandegreen say this on Paul's YouTube, and how dare he do that? <clears throat> That's because... What percentage of the Christian Farm Church listens to my YouTube channel? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I can think that. I small. don't know. Go ahead, Dale. <laughs> I, I it, it, this may be taking us a little off track, but but uh, probably not the first time for you guys. Uh, I've had some conversations uh, dating back probably twenty years, uh, former pastor and stuff. But what was the purpose of the CRC denomination? And and we zeroed in on kind of two, I'll say, divinely ordained uh, missions. Uh, one, provide a nurturing, uh, safe, comfortable place for a century of European immigrants, primarily Dutch, and help them assimilate, come alongside them. Uh, and second, uh, sponsor world missions. And, and I'll, I'll salute the CRC because what they did internationally for as small an organization as they were was stunning in the amount of, of mission in Africa. I mean, I, I, I saw that firsthand, Asia. Uh, but you look now, okay? There are no more Dutch immigrants coming. And- That was the last one. Hmm? I was yeah. the last one for, we got for a reason. In, we shut the door. Yeah. We got guys in our church who were the last one came after you, John. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we didn't shut it hard enough. <laughs> yeah, point number two, then on, on the missions, we now have Africa and Asia sending missions, <laughs> uh, missionaries to America. I mean, my daughter uh, went to Cal State Northridge and she roomed with a girl from Kenya who's parents were missionaries uh, to, to California. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it's that, how, how important is that anymore? My, my, my assistant, Mary, uh, came, her father, uh, her family grew up in, in Taiwan. They came here to America from Asia to, to, to be missionaries. And, and her dad is still a church planner. So it seems to me both of those, those callings have been completed uh, 
would it be the end of the world if somebody pulled out the end of life directive and said, okay, here's where we go from here? <laughs> wow. I don't think so. Just do it well. Mission accomplished. Just do it well. Yeah. Don't, don't do it with, you know, blood all over the floor. Well, it you doesn't know, need to be blood over, all over the floor. In, so in the 1970s, of course, Andy Kivenhoven, who you all, the name you might recognize and remember, you know, wrote that very famous banner editorial, is it time to burn the wooden shoes? Um, and what would Van Donk wear? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> they, they say they work great on the dairy. That's what I've heard. Um, they do. But this, do. but, you know, you know, on CRC Voices on this listserv that some of us participate in, you know, we've been asking that question and the question circles around regularly, but it also opens the door for a larger question, which is how, what are, what are denominations for and um, how, how ought the church to, how ought the church to have connective tissues to both represent itself as part of the universal body of Christ. Okay, all the Roman Catholics are going to chime in with something here. I know. I've, I understand. You're in my mind. Um, <laughs> but Check the comment section. Check the comment section. <laughs> but, you know, but you won't get, you know, as, as all of us know, once you start something, you start the March of Dimes because polio must be defeated. All right. So the March of Polio, the vaccine comes out. What does the organization of the March of Dimes do? We need a new mission. We must, we've, we've created a, a golem, a Frankenstein that must be preserved. And so the denomination does this, you know? Um, but I, at the same time, you know, Clay started out his conversation saying, I'm loyal. And I thought, yeah, me too. Um, is it just nostalgia? And 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 for me, I mean, some will some will say, why on earth, Paul, do you make videos like this? Uh, sometimes I wonder. It's Vendank. It's the Vendank you <laughs> gave me. Um, I have a few more in mind, but he's not very compliant. Yeah, I've said no to some things. Um, <laughs> the Vendank you gave me. <laughs> but. But these, to me, these issues are vital because if you were, even though my church is sort of drowsily aware that we're Christian reformed, the church does have memories of when, you know, when we didn't have a pastor, this is again, classes, classes stepped in and helped. And when we would bring in a new minister, when we bring in a Christian reformed minister, you know, they're well-educated and they preach and teach from the Bible. And they're competent and trustworthy. And so, you know, there is something to this brand and this network that has meant something. And so, and I, I would imagine that in each of your churches, I would get the same kinds of answers with respect to this thing we call the Christian from Church of North America. Maybe not. Well, the one is thing that... The, the one thing that has definitely affected churches on the West Coast and perhaps in other parts of the country also is that, um, you know, you you have on many occasions mentioned our, our proximity to other evangelical communities that have a platform to our members. In other words, other churches are doing things, are talking about the Bible, or are organizing themselves for ministry are doing it with some pizzazz, some, some, some attraction, some, some nuance, some, hey, these churches, they, they are speaking to me in my moment of, of pastoral need, and, and, and those guys were there for me. So, so there's a lot of competition on the local level for pastors to modify their message to become more generically evangelical. And, and I think that that has diluted a lot of appreciation for anything uniquely reformed or anything uniquely Grand Rapids or anything uniquely, um, yeah. And I, and, I, and I think that, that, that 
that what it, what remains then is 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 people who can appreciate the the generic Christianity that manifests itself in our congregations, but that have no particular interest in in what makes the Christian Reformed Church in any manner unique. Well, and what we're living in is a society where what is generic Christianity? You know, I mean, in some context, well, sort of big box evangelicalism, you got some guitars on stage, you hear a message about the Bible with a little application at the end, they give some money to world missions, yada, yada, yada. That's generic Christianity for, well, Orange County, there's a lot of that, and up in Rockland, generic Christianity in my neighborhood is, well, you got a black church, you got a Hispanic church, you know, we're dealing with pluralism here. And part of what's happening in the Christian Reformed Church is that in some ways, the, I mean, the line you were talking about earlier, Doug, is sort of the main line versus evangelical um, divide that continues to be within the Christian Reformed Church. And you've got, um, you've got some people in the denomination, usually with some status or a platform within the denomination that are promoting you know, more mainline-ish ideas. I mean, that's what you were talking about, Doug, in a lot of ways. That's how mainline churches function. But more on, but, you know, mainline hasn't sold real well on the ground. Sells great in the newspapers and at the universities. But when it comes time to building a flourishing church, the evangelicals have done that a lot better. And so, you know, you've, and that's exact, those are exactly the market forces you saw operating in the Reformed Church of America. You had congregations in the West that were larger than whole classes in the East in terms of number of people attending on a Sunday morning. So, you know, there's lots of layers to this thing. So we're kind of weird here in Oregon, but you know, okay, that's Portland's motto, right? <clears throat> so in, in our area, you have um, uh, the evangelicals that, I hesitate to say this, but are kind of simple theologically, right? And, and you have the main lines, but nobody goes there anymore. Like Willamette University, okay, Methodist, okay, big, big Methodist church. It's just that you don't find people there, at least not for church, right? <laughs> and then very, very, very few very few uh, also the 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 uh, Pentecostal uh, is is fairly significant out here where we get our people from and anymore none of them are Dutch is people who actually come for reformed yeah. but what they think of as reformed is not what Grand Rapids thinks of as reformed they're going wait a minute I came to your church because you were reformed you know, and we listen to Rob speak online, da, da, da. Okay, this is what we want. We want this solid, not simplistic Bible message, okay? It's, it's what I always thought that the CRC was all about. And then they get a hold of the banner. And it's like, we, we, we've lost families over this. They, they thought they came to a reformed church, but apparently you're not. So, yeah, I understand people... You know, you want to be reformed. That's different than evangelical. Okay, I find that I, that that's fine, although that's awfully broad brushing. Because hey, you know, reformed is evangelical, depending on how you define that word evangelical. So, so is that we get people from that, right? Um, but we have the main line, but they're gone anyway. You know, they they went to Portland and joined Antifa or BLM or something like that, right? And um. And, and we have the evangelicals that like to come to our church and we're, we're not a big group. There's, there's a lot more Mormons here than, than there are reformed people. I mean, we got a PCA in town, you know, we actually find commonality even among reformed with like a lot of the Baptist churches here. I used to teach a Sunday school by invitation every now and then at a Baptist church where I happen to know quite a few of the people. I was their lawyer, da, 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 da. And the first time I came, I said, all right, so, um, for those of you who don't know me, and I kind of made a joke out of it, I'm a Calvinist, right? And then hands went up. I'm a four-point Calvinist. I'm a three-point Calvinist. I'm a five-point Calvinist. I would never have gotten that response from my own church. Right. <laughs> and I'm going, whoa, whoa, what, what happened here? So, 
every locality has its own how things are moving. And Grand Rapids is very different than here. But my guess is I'm very different than what you guys are in Southern California, than what you, Paul, are in Sacramento, right? I mean, we're all quite different. The point of which maybe is things are becoming more local. I mean, whether we want it or not, things are becoming more local. They just are. Well, well, Dale, you said, well, maybe it's time to, you know, the the CRC end of life directive. I, nobody put that. You got a way of putting things, Dale. I got a lot of I got a lot of highlights on some of your comments, the notes that I've taken here. What what is I mean, is that a good thing? Should we should we go to Senate and say, you know, three more synods and that's about it? Um and we're going to shut down the banner and, you know, spin off, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a piece on my blog in 2015 or 16, where I be at the, one of the last denominational restructure things that I said, the denomination should spin off its agencies because it's, you know, in some ways the tail is wagging the dog with some of this stuff. And the CRC should probably pay more attention to staying close to the knitting and if the Christian Reformed churches wanted to sort of have a communal voice, it's going to have to figure out what that voice is, because right now it's it's very unclear what what the thing is for. But yet, you know, if 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 we were to send down to Southern California, Dale opens up his he gets to church, he opens up his email and sees oh, the Christian Reformed church is sunsetting in five years. Uh, make plans accordingly. Um, you'd have a few council meetings, and I dare <laughs> bet at the classes level, some of you guys would say, you know, well, just maybe Grand Rapids is going away, but we still like meeting together with us. And but and you know, every now and then that Vanderclay comes down as a synodical deputy with his tin badge and his fake gun. And, um, you know, when we do something with a minister and Vander Clay says, yeah, you did it right. And he signs the paper and he goes back to Sacramento. We kind of like Vander Clay coming down and shaking our hand and he makes crazy videos, but we don't watch them anyway. Only the ones Van Donk isn't in. Um, so, you know, what would happen if you, what, what does the CRC end of life directive look like and what comes after that? Clusters. But the, the clusters are probably going to cluster. I mean, I often, I hear, sometimes I hear libertarians talk and they're like, ah, taxation is theft. They're like, okay. And uh, nobody should have to pay for anything that they don't want to pay for. I said, okay, what about the street you live on? Well, I'll just make collections with my neighbors. And I think, have you ever tried to get money out of your neighbors? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I hear these libertarians and I, I keep asking them questions. And before you know it, they've reinvented local government. And after a while, they'll reinvent state government and then they'll reinvent the federal government all over again because these things have sort of developed as they were. And so maybe it's a time in the denomination to say, okay, maybe we need a CRC end of life directive. And maybe we should think about what comes after that end of life directive because my guess is that a lot of churches would want something and my other guess is that probably if you did something the people who built it because they did all of that fresh thinking about what it is for would probably have a degree of commitment to it but that transition between brands i mean we watched home missions and world missions become resonate and I don't know about you, but I don't know if resonate <laughs> resonates with you or not <laughs> as a world, as a couple of world missions people. <laughs> so it's pretty sticky. Know. Resin is pretty sticky, actually. Re the, the resin might have been a better name. <laughs> so I don't know. Should there be a CRC end of life directed and directive and what comes after that? Is that an overture to Senate that Vanda Green and I are going to send up? We're going to ask Senate for a CRC end of life directive. We're going to commit institutional suicide. I think you'd get a lot of cheerleaders. I think you uh, would. I'm starting to wonder whether this video is going to get published or posted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll get posted. Don't you worry, Van Dom. I posted four hours today. I can post this. <laughs> 
but but I, you know i i think I, I think we need, and, and again, this has been my plea for many years now with my confessional conversation thing, which maybe was the words that scared both sides wrong. But I, I do think we need to talk about, I mean, the, the denomination is a multi-million dollar effort that, that, you know, my concern, you know, it's amazing that they are, they went ahead with their rejiggering of the, of the denominational ministry share plan in the midst of a pandemic. That's yeah. gutsy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, I, I work for a tiny little failing small local church, but in some way I feel my job is probably more secure than half the people that work for the denomination because where, where, what does this thing look like in three to five years? And I don't know. I don't know. I think you're right. Especially since you're sort of a side job guy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I think is great. <laughs> yeah, we're all West Coasters. We're all entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's the end of this video or maybe you have something you want to throw on top. Maybe we should just go around and um, finish it off. End of conversation directive. Is that what that is? You know what a post order is? <laughs> I do. Yeah, I wrote one last month. That, so. That's a supercharged. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> a physician ordered a life termination some, something. Yeah. It's the kind um, of stuff that the uh, ambulance drivers want to see before they load you up. Wow. And it's the kind of thing that... Um, um, mm -hmm. Inland Home and, and other uh, el homes for the elderly, they want to have one on file for every resident. Wow. Well, they, I, need, I, they need to know what to do with yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, it's usually in these end of life things that the lawyers get called because you got to figure out what to do with the university and with Back to God, Ministry International, and with the severance packages for the employees and the pension. My beer money. <laughs> the donks beer money um and lawyers there are actually a good thing <laughs> i gotta throw that one in there yeah. well a lot of times lawyers are much less dramatic yeah about all of this okay let's get down to the business of doing it yeah well it's true because the law is sort of this spooky thing out there that can come and grab you or you have fears of it grabbing you you know so lawyers come and say ah here's the terrain and that's here are the rules sometimes we just illuminate here are the rules because nobody can agree on what the rules and we happen to know what the rules are yeah. <sighs> well i don't know is this going to be is this video going to be entitled the crc end of life directed or these guys are loyal to a denomination that no longer exists they're the two uh they're the two potential titles right now it would be interesting if you had the same conversation but with um some some um grand rapids area people well yeah, you know i'd like good. to that would be good <clears throat> you know i don't get a lot of I don't get a lot of uh, inquisitive attention from the powers that be. Maybe they wish <laughs> I, maybe they don't know. I, I doubt they don't know I exist. You remember when I told you once, Paul, that I nominated you for executive director? <laughs> I don't think that would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll still Look what I've it. done with my little church. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> But you know, I, you didn't want a big corporation. You wanted to be entrepreneurial. Well, you know, I love the CRC, and and, and it, I do too. And I do too. I think all of us do, which is why we're here. But the, you know, it comes. You ask yourself a question: Does this any? Does this thing that I love no longer exist? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really enjoyed that. I think it was the 2017, oh, what did they call it? It was this big shindig just out in, in Detroit. Um, it was a, it was more of a, a little rah, rah convention rather than a synod, but I love going to synod. I love, I love seeing my classmates. I love seeing people that I, you know, were in Patterson where I grew up and people I know in Grand Rapids. I mean, when I go to synod, it's, it's a ton of fun and I, 
you know, think fondly of, you know, my CRC brothers and sisters who think very differently than I do on a number of things. And for me, part of what I would love to see the CRC actually facilitate are in fact, again, better conversations between us who have differences. I, if, if there's anything my YouTube channel demonstrates, I love talking to people with different opinions from my own. And I want to have us have better conversations doing it. And I thought, you know, one of the, my great disappointments in the denomination was it's, was what it did with the Belhar. You know, whichever way the denomination decided to do with that document, I thought it's not, we don't know how to process the major issues that are before us in any significant way. Maybe we never did. Maybe I'm just having a dream about some church that never really existed. I don't know. At least not denominationally. I think some classes can. Yeah. So. I don't think the denomination can anymore. All right. Well, that in was... the past, they may not have had to do that because there was this internal cohesion. So it was not even necessary for us to talk through the big questions. Now it's a little different. And there was less scope in what the institutional CRC as a denomination did. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point in that. So, I mean, how, now how are you going to have a conversation on uh, the ag bill? Yeah. The version that comes out of the Senate and the version that comes out of the House, it gets a lot of attention from the denomination. How do you have a discussion about that? That's Each of those it. versions is over a thousand pages. They haven't even read it, but they opine about it. My hobby horse. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, but, but, you know, your, your points are right. The a limited focus, and that's why I, I would have liked to see the denomination sort of spin off the, the agencies, because if they're not, you know, world missions used to be a core. I, I love, you know, Dale, I, you haven't said a lot during here, but what you've said have been really, really good. The CRC had two missions, provide a nurturing, safe, comfortable place for Dutch immigrants to help assimilate and sponsor world missions. It was, that was... That was what it did. It was right there. And now it's sort of all over the place and not, no oh boy. That's not I, sustainable. This is, this what this didn't turn into a feel good conversation at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so maybe, and, but you're also right, John, in that I think in the past you had, you did have leaders who would could basically stand up and you know it was never homogeneous but could in a sense say this is who we are this is where we should go and there was a sense that they could do that and it's just simply diluted for hosts of reasons not all bad so all right i've i've uh Vendank has kept you guys here far too long <laughs> John. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I'm glad you guys showed up. I'm glad you hosted us, Paul. This was good stuff. And uh, we'll have opportunity to reflect on it some more. I'm looking forward to the comment section. All right. Well, I, I, I don't know if the comment section or CRC voices will be uh, most pertinent for this conversation, but um, <laughs> I, I, I've really appreciated what CRC voices did with the Clay Leibolt conversation, though. That I thought was productive. But again, what are the odds that this video will show up on the CRC Facebook site? Or on CRC Network. Or on CRC Network. And, and the problem with an organization that locks itself down like this is if you, if you want to have a conversation, a scary conversation, you got to leave it open and you got to brace yourself to hear from people you don't want to hear from who will say things you don't want to hear. But as you said before, Doug, that's what happens in family. You can't kick them out because they're family, but there they are doing things and saying things you don't like. Anyway. All right. We've, uh, we've. Thanks buried guys. We buried the Christian Reformed Church, and um, <laughs> at I'm least we sure signed a post. <laughs> I, I'm glad that 
they don't hire us centrally so that I can be fired from Grand Rapids. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll post it tomorrow. Okay. Buckle up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> bye bye. I'm not going to check the internet for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah, we'll see y'all.